Well, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, for several years, the Episcopal Church and our diocese has been pursuing becoming beloved community. This presentation continues our efforts to seek reconciliation, justice and healing in the name of Christ. Tonight's workshop titled The Five W's and How is, de is designed to demonstrate what steps you and your parishes might take to begin this work. Oops. <laughs> First question we have to ask is what exactly is becoming beloved community? You may have heard the phrase or seen this labyrinth on flyers, newsletters, or websites. Here's what the official website says about becoming beloved community and about the labyrinth. The Episcopal Church's becoming beloved community vision first presented by the church's key leaders in May of 2017 frames a path for Episcopalians to address racial injustice and grow as a community of reconcilers, justice makers, and healers who share a passion for the dream of God. Because this is the work of spiritual formation and not simply completing a training or implementing a set of programs, individuals and congregations are encouraged to embrace the journey ahead as a long-term commitment. It may be helpful to imagine a labyrinth as, re as you reflect, act, and reflect again. After all, on the road toward reconciliation and healing, we travel around corners, make sharp turns, pass fellow travelers, and double back into quadrants we have visited before, each time discovering a fresh revelation or a challenge. It's really just the path of discipleship walking the way of Jesus. That's why the labyrinth makes so much sense in our, as our guiding image. Because of the work of, because the work of becoming beloved community stems from our faith in Jesus Christ and our commitment to follow his teachings, the Episcopal Church has connected each of the four elements with one of the promises from our baptismal covenant. In the first quadrant, telling the truth, the baptismal vow for this is preserve in resisting evil, and whenever we fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. Important questions that we might ask. What racial, cultural, or ethnic groups are in our churches? Who have we excluded or included? What's the story of race in our parish church? What's the story of race in our larger community? If it's an all white community, why is that? And there's another important question. What things have we done and left undone regarding racial justice and healing? The point of these questions is, is to address the truth of the history of racism in this country, in our churches and communities, and to reveal racism's continuing impact. Mother Mindy Hancock of Seminary Episcopal Church in Marion shared this example of telling, of truth telling. The reconciliation team at that parish dared to dig into that community's past and its infamous 1930 lynching. They shared this information and the ways it continues to impact that community, both at their church, within the diocese and beyond as they have offered seminars on the work of reconciliation. Moving into the next quadrant, quadrant two, we are called to proclaim the dream. In the baptismal covenant, we promise to proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Jesus Christ. Having boldly faced the truth about our past and present, about how we have fallen short of God's hopes for the beloved community, we need to imagine creation as God did before the beginning of time. What would the beloved community of God look like? How would we live in such a community? If we can dream it, what will it take to bring it into being? 
And do we have the courage and the will to do so? Do we have the will to share this dream with others? Practicing the way of love is the third quadrant. It means to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves. Seek and serve are action words. They call us to ask how we will grow as reconcilers, healers, and justice bearers. What activities, practices, learning and experiences would transform us? <clears throat> How will we actively grow relationships across dividing walls and see Christ in the other? It might be by participating in a sacred ground study, which we'll, you will hear more about later, or in an anti-racism book study. It could be hosting a community story sharing event or participating in a racial healing pilgrimage. Practicing the way of love also takes us beyond learning as into the arena of activism. It means standing beside our sisters, brothers, siblings of color, and joining in their cries for justice, recognition, and equity. It may require us to actually stand with them as they protest injustice and discrimination. It may call us to advocate for the rights of those who are often unheard. Finally, practicing the way of love calls us to incorporate this into the life of our congregations, into our worship, our fellowship, and our stewardship of God's gifts. Lastly, the fourth quadrant, repairing the breach, relates to the promise that we will strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. What institutions and systems are broken? How will we participate in the repair, restoration, and healing of people, institutions, and systems? How can we engage in conversa conversations in our parishes, communities, and organizations about systemic racism and inequality, about laws and practices that need changing, and about how to address the lingering effects of past injustices? Parishes, dioceses, and church institutions such as seminaries are already discussing the reasons for and possibilities of reparations. This means researching our histories, not to seek means of defense, but to unearth areas of responsibility. It has been said that love is more appropriately a verb than a noun. If this is so, then love is also active rather than passive. The work of becoming beloved community is hard work, but if we are to follow Jesus, it is work we need to do. It is gospel work. It is the work of discipleship. It is the work of love. Especially now, there may be resistance to this message, and there may be reluctance to engage in becoming the beloved community. Issues of race may be as politicized and divisive as they have ever been. But the openness to change may also be as great as it has ever been. Next, why? Why do we seek to become the beloved community? The simple answer is because we love Jesus and he commands us to love others as ourselves. Christian love though is more than an emotional attachment. It is both personal and communal. Loving others as ourselves means creating conditions and structures so that all of us can live as, as we ourselves wish to live. C.S. Lewis said, love in the Christian sense does not mean an emotion. It is a state not of feelings, but of the will. Such love is a decision, a conscious intention to care for the other as much as we care for ourselves. It is also active. It means doing all that we can to raise others up, to love them and to stand with them. It is what we promised to do when we were baptized into Christ.
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the first quadrant, and which was telling the truth. Um, part of telling the truth is telling the truth about the history of the American colonial church or the Episcopal church and racial injustice. Um, so looking back at 1624, we'll start there. African slaves in the American colonial church um, were baptized by the church. However, they were not treated as equal members of the body of Christ. It wasn't until 1961, 337 years later, that the General Convention of the Episcopal Church declared that racial prejudice was inconsistent with the gospel. This resolution expressed regret for past and present discrimination within the church and encouraged all levels of the church to reconcile itself to, in quotes, the comprehensiveness of the body of Christ and to establish worship and study programs in this area. So what is our truth? Um, I'm gonna take a lot of the examples from a new a book that came out this spring um, that Stephen led us through with our local reading group here. Um, it's a book by uh, the Reverend Canon Stephanie Spellers called The Church Cracked Open, um, Disruption, Decline, and New Hope for Beloved Community. Um, like I mentioned, uh, Stephen led us through a book study, uh, the South Bend Mich Mishawaka Area Episcopal Churches, um, and I highly recommend um, the others read this book um, as well. So in the book, um, the first example of our, our racial injustice history of the Episcopal Church that Spellers uh, uses is what she calls the Triangle of Terror. Uh, which was the slave trade from primarily Ghana in Africa to Virginia here in the colonies and to Liverpool in England. But before, I don't want you to think this is just a, a Southern issue, uh, which we can often do. Most of the financing came from New York. Um, churches in Virginia received land grants and taxes supported the church from powerful colonial leaders. As laws were passed to strengthen slavery, the church said nothing because they were tied to the leaders of the colony. Leading up to the Civil War, other denominations struggled with slavery and a movement against it. Speller says, of all the churches in America, the Episcopal Church was arguably the most willing to continue accommodating slaveholders, traitors, and upper-class racists, and least likely to welcome equal and full participation of Black people, slave or free. Bishop William Wilber Wilberforce of Oxford wrote, the Episcopal Church raises no voice against the predominant evil of slavery. She palliates it in theory, and, pra and in practice, she shares in it. The next example I want to draw from is what Spellers calls the Church of Southern Gentry. The men in leadership in the South were largely Episcopalian and slave owners. Um, Walter Posey writes, nearly all Southern bishops owned slaves, either by inheritance or purchase. When his wife had the option of inheriting money or 400 slaves, Bishop Polk of Louisiana encouraged her to take the slaves as he thought thereby he could function better in his state as a man of influence. Southern slaveholders used the catechism written by Virginia Bishop William Meade against the slaves. The question was, what is the duty of servants? And the response, to be obedient to their masters and singleness of heart is unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing service as to, as to the Lord and not men. So then the question is, what directions are given to servants? And the response is, servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not, sorry, I already said that. Not with eye service, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Several of bishops not only supported slavery, but also white supremacy. Some of these bishops banded together and started the University of the South. Speller states the university's Robertson project, which is currently ongoing um, on slavery, race, and reconciliation has uncovered proof of the founders' white supremacist intentions. For instance, the university's original plans features a school of ethnology and universal geography, a field that studied how geographic region was tied to a single race and how each of those races were arranged in a divine order with light-skinned Europeans and their descendants at the top and Africans and dark-skinned savages at the bottom. As the Robertson Pro Project discovered, the founders and trustees' plan was to make the University of the South a recognized center for study of race and thereby a sturdy ideological pillar of civilization based on enslavement of people of African descent. Now they are working on reparations to correct their history. But like I said, racial injustice wasn't just a Southern issue. The Episcopal Church was silent in New York regarding slavery possibly because many of the landmark churches in the city were built with and maintained with the labor of slaves and funds garnered by the slave trade. 
Many will point to the first black church in Philadelphia and Father Absalom Jones as a point of pride, but they leave out that St. Thomas was not able to participate in a diocesan convention because, and I quote here, the color and physical and social condition and education of the blacks render them unfit to participate in legislative bodies. In 1836, the Bishop of North Carolina published Father George Freeman's message that slavery was agreeable to the order of divine providence. No man without a new revelation from heaven was entitled to pronounce it wrong. The same priest became well known across the country and was elected in 1844 by general convention as a missionary bishop for Arkansas, Texas, and the Indian Territory. A priest from Vermont, John Henry Hopkins, became presiding bishop in 1865. He published The Bible View of Slavery, which was a pro-slavery argument using the Bible as justification. I think you're probably by this point getting the point of where the Episcopal Church is complicit, right, in racial injustice. Um, <clears throat> many times spellers um, continue to state that how the church was silent on issues. We hear this in reference to slavery. It was also true in the 1880s and 1940s when anti-Asian uh, policies uh, were increasing in popularity. Spellers writes that many churches in the West had developed strong relationships with Chinese laborers, but following the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, the diocese opted to close a church which was burned down rather than to protect its Asian members. Further, the Episcopal Church did not help Japanese Episcopalians returning from internment camps to rebuild their churches. In 2020, the House of Bishops Theology Committee paper states, an apathetic silence was the church's response to the plight of its Asian communities, both in local dioceses and in the Episcopal Church nationwide. I think this now expands to one of the fastest growing groups in the Episcopal Church, which is our uh, Latinx or Latino population. Juan Oliver is the custodian of the Book of Common Prayer, and he says, the interpersonal dynamics of inclusion always involves an includer and an included. In the Episcopal Church, Latinos are always being invited, included, and ministered to, but we never get to do anything for ourselves. This usually means that we are welcome guests in someone else's house. How do we ensure that all voices and cultures are heard valued and held up in our faith and communities. The church has to speak out on issues of injustice. And that's what I think beloved, becoming beloved community is about. We can't be silent anymore. We must ask the tough questions. Presenting my, Bishop Michael Curry is taking this to heart. He frequently speaks out for or against issues and offers support. He also asks tough questions like the statements he's recently put out a couple of them this summer um, regarding the indigenous boarding schools across uh, the country which by the way, which Evan shared with us, uh, we have two of in our diocese, one in Wabash and one in Rensselaer. And I have to tell you personally, um, as just the mission for digital communications, whenever we post something in our diocesan email, on social media, things like that, that where uh, presiding Bishop Michael Curry or the Episcopal Church takes a stance or speaks out on an issue regarding racial injustice, I receive all kinds of hate mail and messages back um, even today, just in setting out the announcement about this meeting, I got an email back from somebody in all caps puts hypocrisy. Um, you know, and these are people primarily who I would say are privileged white males, um, not someone who's oppressed. And it really uh, shows me, I think, why we need to have these conversations um, and, and look to move forward and make progress within the Episcopal Church. The last thing I wanna share is just how privileged many of us are in the Episcopal Church. Um, oftentimes the Episcopal Church is called, uh, is known as America's Christian elite. Um, early on, many of the racially motivated laws were written. Our country was led by people who were Episcopalian. Um, in 2014, so it's getting to be a little bit of an older study now, it was reported that 36% of Episcopalians were top earners making more than $100,000 which was higher than any other denomination. The percentage in America was 18%. They also reported that 56% of Episcopalians had earned college or graduate degrees, while the percentage in America was only 27%. Spellers writes, towards the end of the 18th century, the English ruling class had fled. The Anglo-Saxon identified revolutionary founders quickly filled the vacuum and became institution builders. The Episcopal church was the natural church to contain and preserve the culture values and aesthetics of this Anglo-Saxon American elite. If you wanted access to those elite circles or simply gravitated towards their sober and orderly culture, the Episcopal Church was the ideal home. 
She continues, today the prominence of a defined Episcopal ruling class is faded, as has our cachet as the Church of the American Establishment. Ongoing decline and disruption have humbled and opened us to embracing more of the vernacular, the local and multicolored expressions in our surrounding communities. And yet, especially when it comes to liturgy, education, and social standing, Episcopalians continue to resonate with elite culture and whiteness. We still bear the marks of the empire we, we were created to serve. So it bears the question, how do we move forward? So there's a lot of information that was thrown at you as far as where the Episcopal Church is, has been complicit in racial injustice. And we just want to take a moment here to pause and to reflect and to think through how does this uh, make you feel to learn these aspects of our history? If you want to share out loud, that's fine. If you just want to take a moment to reflect silently, that is fine as well. I think knowledge is power. And I think it is very valuable for us to know that and just to understand where our background came from. I don't think it necessarily guides our, it guides our future. And like I said, we know where we're coming from. Um, but I always think knowing the historical background of something is, is valuable. I'm probably different from most of you, besides being a cradle Episcopalian. When I was in the eighth grade, my history teacher was an incredible person. And she taught us stuff about American history that would have gotten her fired had she been in any other school district in the country. So a lot of this is not really new to me. But it's been a long time since I really gave much thought to it, I have to admit. I've shared with others that for me, I've, I value this racial reconciliation as being important, um, but I didn't really necessarily know how it um, tied into the church's history. And so finding and learning this information made it that much more personal, I think, for me. And um, I feel that much more responsible to, I guess, right the wrong um, and to do what we can to to correct um, what has been done through the history of our church. So the question of what becoming beloved community is, is an important one. And of course the core of that is Jesus teaching about what it means to love our neighbor. It means loving without any exceptions. Uh, we've given you some passages here, be devoted to one another in brotherly love or the love of kindred. Those who say, I love God and hate their kindred are liars. For those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Our, our faith calls upon us to love not just in general abstract terms, but to love in those specific face-to-face -face terms, the people that we are in contact with or the people who are affected by our actions. That's the core of our faith. So given all of that, which, which we know, what do we think might cause resistance to doing the work of becoming beloved community? And we had envisioned breaking out into rooms, but I think given how few of us there are, that's not so much to the point. Mother, what do you Terry, think? Can, mm -hmm. can you remind us of the four groups though? So it was individually? Yes, individually, um, as parishes, as the wider church and as a country. And our original idea was that each group, breakout group would take a single one of those. I think individually, Chris gave us an example of resistance. Um, mm -hmm. The email response he got. Um, right. Which I'm sure is not um, a singular response. And um, the people simply don't believe in this or feel that it is a relevant topic. 
precisely or don't want to have want to have the conversation but don't want to have the conversation with us mm -hmm. i think that's something we need to sort of hold in front of us yeah i think that's probably very true about my parish and valparaiso in general there's a great deal of um resistance to even thinking about the issue. Um, which seems strange to me until I read a history of Valparaiso. And then it became very clear to me what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, a perfect example is what happened when we did Sacred Ground. We started out with about seven or eight people. And by the time the se sequence was over with, we had four. And uh, I don't know if it was people just became uncomfortable about hearing uh, the truth of what has been going on or if they just didn't want to talk about it anymore or you know what the problem was. But it was rather disconcerting to me You know what that reminds me of is is the when Jesus is talking to the woman, you know, the scene with Jesus and the woman taken in adultery, when everybody just sort of drifts away without saying anything. Yeah. I think that's often how people react when they're uncomfortable and don't want to don't want to be confronted with what is in front of them. I think um, individually, uh, we have lots of reasons for resisting. It's uncomfortable to talk about. Um, people feel hopeless, like we talk about it all the time. There's not a solution. I'm not part of the problem. This is someone else's problem. Uh, so I think there are lots of reasons why individually people resist. And I think those same reasons exist for parishes as well, you know, this is not our biggest concern. Our biggest concern is, you know, balancing the books. So uh, we're, right. we are welcoming everyone, but nobody comes uh, to our church or there's, you know, we live in a community where there aren't people of color. So this really isn't our, our issue. Um, the question that I always wonder, like s s for me, the connection to my faith um, being a practicing Episcopalian and Christian is so obvious that I always wonder why it's not obvious to other people, right? You know, like. I think, and this affects probably all, all four of the levels that we were gonna talk about. Mm -hmm. The times are just so contentious that I think people shy away from anything they think might be controversial or confrontational because they're just tired of fighting. And I think that, you know, when you bring up something that they kind of just kind of want to pull back and get away from it. So one of the things we're going to talk about here in a little while is other methods. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, that that is probably a big issue these days. So in the uh, prior slide, we had an opportunity to talk about um, why there might be resistance um, to becoming beloved community. And we continue sort of asking the question, why do we seek to become beloved community? Um, we've talked about the need to show the love of Christ both personally and communally. And we've asked um, ourselves and um, each other uh, about this resistance. So the Episcopal Church began implementation of Becoming Beloved Community in 2016. 
the anti-racism resources the church has created seeks to root our response as Episcopalians in the baptismal covenant, as you um, heard earlier and saw earlier in the prior slides. We seek to be reconcilers, justice makers, and healers. Why? In the covenant, we pledge to proclaim the word and example of Christ, to love our neighbors as ourselves and to strive for justice and peace. We engage in that work by learning as we're doing tonight and we must continue to do, to continue to learn. We engage in this work by praying. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and by acting. Last year in a workshop for clergy, a colleague um, used this phrase and I just thought it was ingenious. Do, be, do, be, do. The idea is to really hum it, dooby dooby doo, to think about how you can seek guidance and support so that you're that last B, right? That you do, you be, you do, you be, you do. You are becoming beloved uh, community through the actions that we take. And so the next question has a very obvious answer. Who should participate in becoming beloved community? And um, so this is a, a place where I envisioned everyone on the count of three answering. One, two, three, everyone. everyone. Right. As Christians, as Episcopalians, we're all on uh, this journey. We're all walking the way of love. And I think it's important to note that we're uh, on the same journey, but we may not be on the same path. The journey is long. It's gonna have ups and downs. It's gonna have setbacks and obstacles and challenges, but yet we know victory is mine, saith the Lord. So we're all on this journey. And just as we saw in the image of the labyrinth, we may pass each other. We may take some sharp turns. We may take some curves, but we are all walking. Um, in this way of love. So then that raises the question of where we practice becoming beloved community. And so we thought we would go through some examples of some arenas in which beloved community can be practiced. So with interpersonal relationships, it's important to begin your work examining your own beliefs. We don't want you to approach this from a state of self-righteousness, but be honest with yourself and acknowledge your own faults. If this is your first discussion of this type, why are you here? Are you open to receiving information from this presentation? Are you open to receiving new information? After you have self-examined a bit and after you become more comfortable with your own reasons for being here, it inherently becomes easier to approach this subject with family and with friends. It becomes easier to approach it without anger, with honesty and truthfulness. And that's important when it comes to discussing beloved community in the workplace or in schools or in congregations because the more you've examined your own motivation, the less defensive you are likely to be when people disagree with you. And in all of those, um, all of those locations, you are likely to encounter a variety of views, not all of which will, you know, be in agreement with you. Um, it's important in each of those areas to seek common ground with the people you're having these discussions with, to, to think about what it is that you share in common with them and how the work of becoming beloved community is important for you because you have been put by God in that workplace, school or congregation to speak to those individuals. And that's something that you should use um, as a tool. 
And there's even relationships uh, at the community level, not just your local community, but regionally and nationally and, and even globally, um, where you can live out the practice of becoming beloved community. These things, these networks at the local level and at the regional and national and global level often grow from your interpersonal relationships, from your relationships in your workplace, your congregation, your school. Um, here at Gethsemane and Marion, we uh, have a local, uh, a local community organizer who we work with a lot. Um, and that started as a personal relationship between our previous rector's wife um, and this person. Um, and they've asked us to jump into issues locally uh, where they've said, you know, there are, um, you know, something is going on in our schools that we could use someone from, uh, we could use people from churches to come out and advocate for this issue. Um, issues uh, with our police that our clergy have been asked to be involved in. And so um, these connections in your local government, uh, at the regional and national and global level, really grow out of these interpersonal relationships, your relationships from work and school and your congregation. And there are tons of places to get connected. Oh, sorry, Sherry. No, no, sorry. I just clicked at the wrong point. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, but lots of lots of places to get connected. Uh, you know, regionally, you can be a part of this group, the Beloved Co Becoming Beloved Community Commission, or even the uh, Province Five Becoming Beloved Community Commission. Um, nationally, there's the Episcopal Public Policy Network, which gives you an opportunity to advocate on national and even global level. So there's lots of ways to, uh, places to get connected um, and to do the work of beloved community. So this is another one of those slides where we're asking an obvious kind of question. Um, when should you engage in becoming beloved community? When do we practice becoming beloved community? One, two, three. Now. Now, now. yeah. Yeah, because if not now, then when are we going to? We will always, there's, it, this is kind of like um, the old saying about, you know, there's never a good time to have children. Uh, that, <laughs> that, you know, we all, we are good as humans to, at avoiding things that, alarm us. And, and one of the big ways we avoid things that alarm us is by saying, well, you know, now is not the time. Um, but now is the time. It's for this kind of time that God has created us and positioned us where we are. So how do you make, how do you make the case? Where do you make the case? Uh, kind of you know, okay, I need to convince the people in my parish that this is work that is meaningful and important to our church. Where do I convince them to do that? How do I convince them to do that? And I think it's important to say at the beginning of this, you don't have to wait till you've figured it all out to start making the case. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have thought through all the questions. Um, I know I am a person who <laughs> likes, to, likes to have all the information up front, likes to find all the answers and have everything in order. Um, but the reality is the answers don't all exist. Uh, they're not all, um, they're not all there and easy to find. And so if we wait to figure all of this out, to solve all of our problems, to answer every question about how we become beloved community, uh, we will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be at this forever. <laughs> we'll never get a chance to make the case. And so, uh, so it's important to know that you don't have to wait to have figured everything out before you start talking to other people about, hey, I think this work is important. Um, so as far as where you can do that, I think Ken and Terry will talk about this in just a moment some more, but in your sermons, uh, if you're a clergy person, uh, if you have the opportunity to preach, even if you're not a clergy person, that's a thing that happens in our church sometimes, um, you can talk about why beloved community work matters so much. You can do it in one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, talking to uh, you know, your friends, other people in your congregation, you can have conversations just about, you know, what you've been learning, kind of what you've learned as you've examined yourself and um, 
about why you feel like this work is really important and why the church needs to do it. You can host a book club. Um, I know there's a number of parishes that have done this kind of thing, hosted a book club and said, let's discuss, let's uh, get together and have conversations about this. You can uh, have an adult forum, a Sunday school class, a, uh, some kind of special event. Uh, Gethsemane has done a number of these um, Saturday events where people will come together for several hours and have lunch together um, and have an opportunity to talk about beloved community work and why it matters. Uh, formation for children and youth. It's vitally important to remember that beloved community work isn't just for adults. Um, it's for kids and it's for teenagers too. It's for college students. Um, there is, you know, uh, often we think of this as like, oh, this is adults work. Uh, but there are places that uh, kids and teenagers go that we don't, um, you know, they are in schools, in classrooms, hearing what their classmates and their teachers are saying, and they need to have that opportunity to talk about beloved community um, and how we can move towards this goal. And so it's important to make the case in our children's and youth ministry as well about why this work matters. Uh, we do it in the choices and messaging we make about outreach, uh, who we choose to reach out to, how we choose to reach out to them. Um, are we you know, reaching out in a way that is uh, uh, that is helpful and conducive and responds to the community's actual expressed needs, not just what we think they need. Um, and you can also make the case in uh, a lot of those, you know, venues like your church newsletter or a church blog or uh, a priest's letter that your priest might send out and other places like that, that you have the opportunity to make the case. And this isn't just a one, you know, so just a one route thing. You can't just say, well, I put an article in the newsletter and nobody responded. Uh, this is something, you know, people receive information differently. Uh, communication needs to be multifaceted to hit people where they're best, uh, where they can best receive it. And so making the case is something that's not just one and done. It's uh, something you have to do over a period of time in a number of different ways uh, to really reach people where they are and help make this case to them. It's also important that we tune the message that we're delivering to the audience and the occasion um, on which we're giving that message. So, for example, we don't always have to be explicit that we're talking about becoming beloved community. There are a number of foundational theological and social values that inform and inspire the work for racial justice. And so, when we are promoting those values, we are also promoting the work of becoming beloved community. And in some ways, building those up allows people to come to conclusions at their own pace. Um, and so, you know, they think it's their own idea. And, and that often is, can be, in some cases, can be more effective than saying something explicitly. We've got to do both. But remember that you're doing that work even when you're not being explicit. Um, we should use the full range of spiritual response and not just the call for repentance. The call for repentance is strong, right? We need to make the call for repentance, but we should also remember to give thanksgiving, to praise God for courageous work that has been done by people in the past and is being done in the present, to lift up those hopeful models that are there for us and to rejoice in them. We should practice lament, calling God to account for the pain and suffering that is in this world and to join with God in lamenting that. Um, we should express hope and vision. That's part of what proclaiming the dream is about, is expressing a vision for the future. We should intercede for one another, right? That one, in some ways, almost ought to go without saying, right? When we know that people are doing the hard work, we should pray for their strength and courage. When we know that people are suffering, we should pray for their consolation. Um, doing that, claiming these people, whoever those people are, are, those people are our people. 
and therefore we pray for and with one another. Oblation, fancy word for gift giving, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Um, and also offer up your own behavior as a sacrifice to God. And finally, blessing. Um, what we bless, we strengthen. And so, so blessing, whether explicitly or implicitly, the good that we see around us is an important part of becoming beloved, of realizing our own belovedness and that of the people around us. And of course, it's not always in words, right? Um, there's that whole preach the gospel always when necessary, give words. We, we you know, can, um, we can argue for beloved community with our bodies. I mean, we can vote with our feet, with the way we sing, with the images with which we surround ourselves, um, with use of light and shadow, right? There are all sorts of ways in which we can reinforce, reinforce the message of becoming beloved community with our bodies as well as with our words. And of course, you know, we need to consider the form and not just the content. Different people are going to be reachable through different means. Um, their study of, of like different love languages, right? They're, they're different forms that express love to us and which we feel are we are most able to express love, whether that's words of praise, whether that's touch, whether that's um, by gift, giving gifts, right? All of those love languages are ways in which we can express love of neighbor and therefore engage in the work of becoming beloved community. There are going to be people in our faith communities who are bored to tears by a, or, or worse, threatened by a book study because maybe they didn't like school so much. But if you ask them to prepare a meal for someone, they're right there. They're going to do it, right? So if it turns out that the message isn't coming through in one way, shift and come at it from a different angle. So it's time for another discussion, except we're not going to break out so much. How might you make or have you been making the case in your community? And what do you think your next steps ought to be? And why do you think it might be difficult to take action? I'm going to start with the third question. And mm -hmm. kind of as, as we said before, this it's, it's a tough environment. It's a tough topic to discuss. Um, we know there's resistance. And um, we just have to soldier on through this and not give up. Um, I, you know, I think believing um, that we can make this better, that we can open minds and maybe even change minds is motivation enough. Mm -hmm. So um, at Holy Trinity, I, I think that um, we are trying to live out becoming beloved community uh, in all of the things that we do. And, uh, and I will say, I feel a, a bit self-righteous that we do more than <laughs> Than, than other places in the diocese because there's so few of us. But um, I think the challenge um, is to, to do more. And that presented itself um, this past week when we have uh, a member, I would say an informal member of our parish who is struggling, who, who came and just reminded me so much of, um, you know, that she just gave everything that she had to the church. And uh, it, uh, it just really struck me that there's still more for us to do in, uh, in ways that we can be supportive of her and others in our community. So even, I guess the bottom line is that even when you think that you're doing well, there's still more to, to do. Mm -hmm. 
I think at the cathedral, we've done a really good job of um, kind of educating ourselves and doing some study um, and learning about racial injustice. Um, I think in some ways that there's some times that that's uncomfortable, but for the most part, it's pretty comfortable because you're doing it with people that you know. The topic can be a little uncomfortable, but there's some security there, you know, doing it with the group. Um, and so our next steps, I think we've come up with a bunch of ideas of kind of what that might look like, you know, whether it is, um, you know, looking at like the art and visuals that we have, icons that we have in the cathedral and changing those out. Um, whether it's doing some type of reparations work, whether there's all there's a whole list of things that, that Stephen has of things that we can do. Um, and I think our challenge is trying to figure out what that next step is. Um, and in some ways, knowing that it's gonna it's gonna make us uncomfortable. We're taking that next step, you know, in the process of um, not being as insular maybe and kind of putting ourselves out there a little bit more, being more visible, um, which I think is, is a challenge. It's a good challenge. It's taken another step, you know, in our spiritual growth. But. What's frustrating for me um, is to break through the barrier of uncomfortableness and um, denial that is going on and has been going on at St. Andrews for a very, very long time. Um, and I don't know how to overcome that. Uh, for example, I tried to have us have conversations two years ago and was kept put it, kept being told to wait. We're not, we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, I was surprised that we did the conversations on our marriage proposal uh, because no one wanted to talk about that either. And I, I don't know what I can do to get, to, to get them to be, to be willing in spite of the discomfort to sit down and talk about the issues. Because like I said, the history of Valparaiso is not very um, reassuring, mm -hmm. if you will. And it goes way beyond the issue of black and white. Uh, we used to have quite a few Asian doctors in the community and they've all either retired or left. Um, and we, have a few more now uh, African American people in the community, but we only have two families in our parish. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we actually surprisingly have very few Latinx people. In Valparaiso itself, there are in other parts of the county, but not in Valparaiso. And it goes way beyond race even. It, it's um, socioeconomic status and um, whether or not you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. all of this undercurrent of uh, suppressed anger, suppressed refute, denial to talk. We, we don't wanna talk about this. It's too uncomfortable that kind of thing. And it's, I don't know how to break through that. That's, that's a thing that I, I wish I had, I actually meant to say and didn't, is that sometimes part of what it takes to, you know, you spoke of that underlying anger and denial and, and, you know, this is too uncomfortable. Sometimes in order to enable people to face what's uncomfortable in one area, you have to sort of turn up the comfort level in another area, which is part of that thinking about what are the, what are the things that your 
community, your faith community does that really help them feel secure? And see if you can sort of use that as a container so that they feel safe enough to have the uncomfortable conversation. Um, and like, I mean, if I were doing this at Holy Trinity, the obvious thing to do would be to have food. Because boy, yeah. we like, right? That's 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 who we are, that's what we do. Um, you know, there are all sorts of things that we're willing to discuss over a meal that we would not want to discuss if there were no food on the table, right? Or that we would oh, not yeah. want, they wouldn't want me to discuss in a sermon. Um, <laughs> and so thinking about what that, I mean, in some sense, think about what your congregation's security blanket is and say, you know, you're not telling them this, right? That would sound condescending. But but basically, I mean, what you're saying is like you would say to a child, I will hold your hand while we cross the street, Ooh. right? Um, and so what would be the, equivalent of saying we are here together to work together you know what is the mode um and it might be two or three different things that can create a safe space in which those difficult conversations can take place um because yeah sometimes people just i mean especially these days right because stress is just oh yeah up to our up to our eyeballs I mean, COVID is making an enormous difference. Um, we've been pretty much not gathering as a congregation in any significant number because of the COVID restrictions. And that is not helping, I'm sure. Right. Right. So when people are worried that the congregation's not going to come back together at all, they're going to be extremely reluctant to have a conversation that they think is going to further fracture the congregation. So if you can provide reassurance um, in that regard, that will increase the likelihood that people will be willing to discuss the tough issues. And it may be that you have to sort of back up and talk about those foundational values for a while until the culture, you know, until things have changed enough and get, just get people, it's like the, the, you know, the story about the, the frog, right. In the pot that if right. you turn up, you know, if you put, try to drop the frog into the boiling water, they're going to, it's going to hop right back out again. But if you turn up the heat gradually, the frog, I mean, in some sense, this is an unfortunate example because the frog dies, but right. But right. at any rate, you get the idea. Moving right along, back to the slides, <laughs> where Terry makes another unfortunate analogy. Yeah, Pamela, if, if I can, just one thing that I might sure. add. I think, uh, you know, when there, you know, when there isn't necessarily a, like, sustained, you know, your whole congregation wants to go in this direction or you know, or there's a real push from, you know, the, the vestry or the clergy to do it. Like, I think there's also a lot of value in just having, you know, seeing who will come with you, <laughs> um, you know, just mm -hmm. being like, you know, I, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do this work and I'm going to drag whoever with me will come with me. Um, and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And that is absolutely a more tiring way to do this work uh, in a more you know it'd be great if we could just get ever you know get everybody in a room and be like okay this is the thing we care about we're all doing it let's go <laughs> and sometimes it happens that way um but i think there's also value and validity in that like you know what for this week it's me and it's me and you know my my pal joe <laughs> we're gonna go and we're gonna do this and maybe next week somebody else will join us. Um, I think that it's important to remember that work has validity too, and it matters a lot. Um, so even if, you know, I, I feel the frustration of those moments of, you know, I, I just want something to happen. I just want us to go somewhere. Um, so I think it's important to remember that what you're doing, however much it can be, matters a lot. So.
Okay. So how do we become a beloved community and responding to resistance with love? Um, we've talked about resistance and the many forms of that. And I think it's important that we know that we approach this issue, but we don't necessarily always approach it in the right manner. Um, we might have an uncomfortable situation or a, a setting that's not comfortable for many people. And I think it's important to always bring this back around to, we are children of God, we are Episcopalians, we, we have a common belief, and the goal of this discussion is to reach that level of love that we all believe in. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge if you're hosting the conversation or, or inviting others, I don't have all the answers. Um, this is just a discussion. We are exploring, we're learning, and we're healing. Um, I'm not looking necessarily for the right answer. I'm just looking to open doors for answers, questions, and further discussion. It's also important to understand people are anxious about this. Um, this conversation and their anxieties might be amplifying their concerns. So you're looking for other ways of stability and to make people feel comfortable and also recognize that some anxieties might be from people who had the discussion before and are frustrated, maybe looking for a level of commitment or um, action that's going to be taken after the discussion. So it is, again, assuring people that we're not looking for the right answer. We are looking for many answers, but mainly so that the door is open, that we can all come through this and un reminding people that we're all children of God searching for this. The other thing to understand in becoming beloved community, we're right in the middle of this. Um, we are not out of the woods yet. And these wounds have been 400 years in the making, but we aren't at a point where we can say, yep, we've solved the problem. As a matter of fact, uh, the problem probably has renewed and we have new problems to solve. Um, but again, it's important to rest on your faith as you're approaching these discussions. When you get tired, rest, don't quit. And think about others that you know, is it a white privilege that you can rest and other people cannot? Other people are constantly questioned or asked or viewed in a certain way. Join or form support networks for consolation, renewal, and the occasional reality check. You can find even a small group of like-minded people. This will help to renew you. Don't neglect your prayer life. As a matter of fact, include your prayer life as a part of becoming mm -hmm. a beloved community. And don't neglect self-care and that it's important at some points to step away. But it's also important to have friends around you that can support you when you do need it. So this is another one of those check-in times. How are you feeling? How does a discussion like this make you feel? Does it make you feel overwhelmed, excited, energized, encouraged? Just what does a conversation like this do for, um, for you at this time? Well, I'll start on this one, if that's all right. Sure. I guess I feel, uh, I guess I feel kind of energized. Um, We've been, uh, yeah, like Christopher said, been doing a few things in our congregation for the last year and a half. And this kind of work takes constant, you know, evaluation and thinking about what you're doing and what you can do better. And um, I think there's been a lot of important ideas tonight. And I've got a lot of wheels turning that, you know, once you've done a few things, you can think about maybe what you've not been doing so well as well as the things you've been doing well. I think for me, I, you know, the more you learn about the history of the Episcopal church and our participation in racism, you think, you know, our community needs to focus on this telling the truth part, because this is, you know, 
no, do we know this? Does our congregation know that this is our history? So I, I'm so focused on telling the truth that sometimes I forget to proclaim the dream. <laughs> and I, and, you know, it also, you know, just the idea of, you know, a variety of spiritual responses I thought was really helpful for me to remember because I do gravitate towards a few of those rather than the whole, uh, you know, variety. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's always challenging being part of this work, but um, I think that there is uh, a lot of a lot of hope, and I'm grateful for this conversation. So, thank you. How does it how does it make you feel? I hope that wasn't us. You were gesturing. Oh, I was trying to chase a moth away. How does it make us feel that there are so few of us on this call tonight? Because that's part of the whole purpose is how do we make the case to people to be interested in this topic enough to become involved, right? Right. Um, a little bit disappointed, but I don't know, and maybe Christopher or Mother Terry can answer like, uh, I think because I, my mind has been so focused on just preparing for tonight, yeah. I don't know what outreach, you know, um, whether people are just busy and, um, you know, maybe there'll be more people next um, next week when the second one, it's, a, it's disappointing. I, I, you know, I think around the diocese, I feel like people feel like this, we're beating a dead horse. Like, didn't we do that already? But mm -hmm. the, um, I, yeah, it's, it's disappointing, definitely. Well, I know in my case, I can understand to a certain extent why, because uh, I am missing a vestry meeting tonight. <laughs> You'd rather be here than a vestry meeting? Yes. Wow. Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, you're going to say you, you'd rather be here than having a root canal. <laughs> <laughs> Never. No, I think that is. <laughs> I think in some sense, what we're experiencing tonight is exactly what we're talking about. Right. That there are going to be times when we host a party and nobody comes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we have to allow ourselves to um, to recognize and grieve that that's a real, but that that's in some sense the exact phenomenon, right? That we're that we're here to discuss is the fact that we want to discuss these issues. We want to do something, and people opt out in lots of different ways. Um, so. That's, I mean, as Gina says, that's that's part of right the ongoing work. We have to do self care in that, and remember that um, our faith. You know, the Bible spends an awful lot of time talking about remnants, mm -hmm. right? Of, of various people saying, "I called a party and nobody came," or everybody's going in the opposite direction, God, what do I do? Um, and so that's, you know, we need to be looking for our strengths to those accounts and God's response to those accounts. Mm -hmm. um, because we live at a remnant church. Yeah. To your question, Ted, I mean, it's, 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 you always want everyone to be interested in and involved in, in this sort of thing. I guess my, my question is always about, you know, it, what's the participation of clergy in these conversations and how many lay people feel empowered to lead these conversations in their, in their ministry settings? And there are a number of parishes where I think lay people are empowered. I'm, I'm a lay person, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I guarantee you there are people from every congregation who, who care about this, but whether they feel like there's a, a real space in their church to lead these conversations, I, I don't know. And that's, 
I, but it's it's yeah it's 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 always uh difficult but the, the hope is that for me that the, there is someone in every church and it's it's making sure that they have the tools they need to either start or just find others in their congregation yeah. who are who are interested as well i guess so mm-hmm. it's mixed mm-hmm. good Well, and in fact, lay leaders are more equipped in many cases than clergy because so many clergy are have to, are sort of worried about angering parishioners. Yes. Right. Right. I mean, so so we never <laughs> act, we never feel like we're acting just on our own behalf, but on behalf of the congregation. And if the congregation doesn't like being acted upon, <laughs> having, you know. I don't know if I, if I know how to parse that. If the congregation doesn't like those actions being done on their behalf, there we go. Um, then, you know, the, the clergy are more likely to feel threatened. Whereas a, a lay leader is more, in, is more easily enabled to act as an individual now then the question is what kind of support are you given, right? So that you're not acting by just by yourself in isolation. And so there's a there's a difficult dance to be done there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a number of next steps that um, that you can take that that you know we as a commission are going to be supporting as a, um, you know, in addition to what you do locally. And one of the things we need, we continually want to offer as a commission is that community that you are never by yourself in your congregation um, doing this work. There are always people who are um, your kindred in other congregations who are are joined in this work and we're here for you. Um, some specific things that we have planned is are to start up a sac- another sacred ground cohort in January, and the the hope is for that to be a hybrid approach where there are some sessions where we come together as a whole group on Zoom, and other sessions where there are smaller groups in con- um, in person gathering, and so we're in the in the process of figuring out who some of the facilitators might be for that um, and doing the planning of what that would look like. And the idea again is to roll that out in January uh, for those who are still interested in doing fresh, um, doing sacred ground and didn't get us a chance the first time around. Um, Also, there's this work of truth and reconciliation that is going on across the church. And I've, been, I've reached out to a number of people who do work in um, his, local history as a field, and, and as well as to our diocesan archivist to shape a workshop that would show people how to do that kind of truth and reconciliation work in our particular context. What are the issues that we might be looking for and what are the documents we might use to substantiate that, right? So it is um, not the case as far as we know in this diocese that any churches were built with slave labor, right? We can't really do like um, Virginia the- Theological Seminary has done. But what we can do is look at things like, um, gee, you know, these are the people who gave a lot of money to build our church. Where did they make that money? And mm-hmm. was it in... Um, in industries that relied upon materials that were the fruit of slave labor in the South. Um, we've got people, well, I mean, we, I, I could go on, but at any rate, looking at, you know, how w- were the locations where we chose to build our churches um, influenced by redlining? Um, what is the influence of white flight on, on our, our congregations and their placement, all sorts of questions like that. So we're we're um, looking for a time to gather to develop that workshop. It'll be coming soon. Um, 
you you may or may not have heard of Bishop Sparks talking about the pilgrimage that he hopes to make on the Trail of Death, Potawatomi yeah. Trail of Death during his sabbatical. And we're hoping to um, develop some opportunities surrounding that so that that the entire diocese can join into the learning um, on that. And again, there are other things that that we're interested in. If you end up having an idea that seems like something that would be best developed on a diocesan level rather than on a local level, you know, be in conversation with us because that's part of what we do as well as supporting the work that's going on in individual congregations. The last thing is we just want you to stay in touch with us. Um, so there is a, a Google email group that uh, Terry has put together. Um, so it's listed there. Um, let us know how things are going, you know, work that you're doing. Um, how can we help you? How can we be there to support you? Um, you know, we're, we're more than happy and willing to do that. We also have a Facebook group that's set up. Um, so you can find that Becoming Beloved Community, E-D-N-I-N on Facebook. Um, and we'll periodically post different articles, stories, events that are happening um, either around the diocese or just in our local communities. Um, so you can take a look at that. And then also share um, events or news with us that you want to be included in the um, DASIS and e-news on our website, um, social media. Um, I think part of what we need to do is to communicate what's happening in those faith communities that are really um, working on becoming beloved community and let that work be seen by others in the diocese. And hopefully that will help to encourage um, this work to spread, you know, across our entire diocese. Um, and so I'm the one who created this slide. You would think I would know my email. That's not the right email address. <laughs> I was wondering, I was looking at that and I was going, really? I could have sworn it was mil- missioner.hillock. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to be. I edited it on the slide while you were doing this presentation, but didn't carry through <laughs> to this. So, yeah. But I think uh, both Stephen and, and Pamela have my email. So I think they know where to find you. Yeah. Look, f- search e news in your, in your inbox. <laughs> so, are there other questions? Um, so, this, this is where we let you go, but we're happy to talk yeah. some more. I just have a quick question. It seems to me that when I took the original training two years ago, or whenever that was, mm-hmm. there was conversation within the group over various other forms of discrimination that has existed in the Episcopal Church, and not just concentrating on, for example, black and white racism. Mm-hmm. And um, has this been a change? I mean, I understand that racism is a major issue in the country right now, Mm -hmm. but um, there have been so many other ways that the Episcopal Church over the years has discriminated against other groups based on things other than color of skin or country of origin. And uh, was there a reason for excluding that from the conversation? No, I mean, I think that it's, it's, I mean, I don't know that there was a desire to exclude other things. It's a, simply a question of focusing, you know, we can only focus in so many directions at once. And so, you know, we're, we're aware of, I mean, you know, if you look around this group, we're, we're all quite aware of, um, you know, discrimination based on sexual orientation. We're, certainly aware of discrimination um, in terms of gender, right? I mean, so so we do that in other modes. Um, mm-hmm. It's just not the particular focus of this particular, um, this particular effort. Uh, I don't, so I don't think, I don't think that there's, me- and I think it's kind of like, the situation where universal design, for example, um, so designing spaces, websites, you know, all sorts of um, facilities, so as to improve access for disabled persons, ends up improving access 
for others as well um, who are not disabled. I think the more the same message of love that is proclaimed, the same dream of love that is proclaimed um, in the work of becoming beloved community is not simply about race. And if we're practicing that, we're going to practice it across the board. Um, but because we've neglected race for so long, we're, you know, we're choosing to focus there in this particular season um, with more intensity than, than on other issues. Um, but even there, I mean, it's a question of what week it is, right? I mean, right. Um, I could look around the room and, and, you know, I mean, I think everybody here is engaged in more than one effort, just as, you know, you're also, I mean, creation care is also an important part of this, right? <laughs> and there are ways in which, you know, like the braiding sweetgrass discussion that's happening tomorrow um, is, I think it's tomorrow, right? Right. That's about environmental issues and Native American issues. Um, and so it's, you know, on the one hand, the, the Creation Care Commission is the one that's sponsoring it. On the other hand, you know, the boundaries are loose. And I think that's true here as well. Sorry, I won't belabor this. It may just uh, something for thought, but um, when Ken and uh, Stephanie Spellers was on the uh, diocesan DOK meeting last fall, she made the suggestion of having uh, an ambassador from each congregation who was either participating or interested in participating in this work. Um, maybe someone who had taken some sort of anti-racism training of some sort or, or just had, you know, that initial interest, but I, I don't know, both for communications, even for events like this, it can really help to have a member of your congregation email you or ask you if you're going to something like this. Um, I don't know if that's something the commission, if this commission might consider compiling a, that kind of a list not to add to your, already a great list of responsibilities but um right so we we have <laughs> the thing is that we when we did the survey a, a while back right we asked for those names oh, and the difficulty was that the clergy did not um were not always the person who responded and so right. there were some individuals who responded on their own and some clergy didn't respond so we actually have a list and when we did a trial run of this workshop over the summer we reached out to the persons on that list specifically. I and mean, it's something we need to circle back to, but, mm -hmm. but it is something that we've been working on incorporating. Um, we just haven't gotten very far with it. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. And, um, you know, if you can think of, if you, you were thinking, oh, I know who needs to hear that, tell them to join us next Wednesday. Okay. All right. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.